Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Gloostick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time and have a collection of hundreds of monster ecology and strategy videos on my channel. If you like what I do, please consider subscribing as I upload at least twice a week and I know there's a lot of you out there that haven't subscribed yet. I can see the stats. The 600th layer of the abyss. We visited there before on this channel during the video on the ancient entity called Pale Knight who occupies a dreadful plateau there. It's quite a large area with her tower right Right in the middle, there's nothing but bones everywhere. Even the tower is made of bones, uh, specifically countless skeletal hands. And inside her tower, a vast gallery of weird, frightful displays. Each contains nothing but the captured shadow of one of her former victims. But moving out from there, we cross into the endless maze that forms the horizon on all sides of her domain. And as we cross over into the territory of the demon lord named Baphomet. It's an infinite plane that stretches off in darkness. There's a rough geology to it, but it's like someone tore a plane of the Bitopia in half and threw it into a realm of eternal night, then set forth a massive army of evil dwarves obsessed with building the most insane maze that the multiverse has ever seen. It just goes on and on and on, as far as the eye can see. But there is a centre to it, and this is where most of the travel to and from the plane occurs. Unless someone has an exact location they've previously visited and left some sort of a marker behind. The maze is not uniform. Some sections are like walking through a huge hall of a cathedral. Others are dirty crawl spaces no more than five feet wide or tall. And there are some parts that are almost like natural caverns and twisting ravines closer to the realm of Pale Knight. This natural looking formation is dominant, uh, but closer to the residence of Baphomet himself, the maze becomes more constructed precise, almost pristine and spotless aside from the gruesome remains of his victims, witnessed as sprays of blood and gore across walls, floor and ceiling. Serving a stark reminder that this is the home of a being of both keen calculating mind and violent savagery that knows no limits. Baphomet is like the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde of the Demon Lords. The Endless Maze is both his hunting ground and the lair of his favoured servants. And also the dumping ground of his vile mistakes, because rising up in one of the few visible prominent parts of the maze is his so-called Tower of Science, a huge edifice surrounded by more of a dungeon than a maze, filled with all manner of twisted horrors, including fearsome beasts uh, I will talk about later called the Anchor Shars. Actually, let me read you uh, the whole article from the Dragon Magazine Demonomicon of Igwilv article, because it has all the information about his realm that you will need. Baphomet himself does not know us. he was once a man whose feral nature led him along a path to the beast or if he was once a beast with the strange and wretched aspirations of living life as a man. Nor does he care to remember what he was before he came to gaze upon the abyss and his soul laid bare and open before its entropic caress. It matters little. What matters is what he has become. He is the embodiment of all that is virile and strong in the continents of savagery, tempered with the keen mind and intellect of a scientist and a scholar. He is a man who uh, rut and ruin like the wild nate creatures of the primeval world, yet he's also a beast given the gift of society and culture. He's not hampered by the shortcomings of either and is tempted, uh, tempered with the strengths of both. Legends speak of how Baphomet was once a man who dared to treat the gods like cattle and was cursed for his blasphemy and cast into the pit. Yet Baphomet observes his kingdom now populated by a prosperous race created entirely in his own image, and it is in an infinite realm bounded only by the imagination of its master. Full of fanatical worshippers who whisper his name with reverend awe, Baphomet knows the gods did not curse him. For what curse is it, is it is it that grants a mortal man or hungry beast the powers of a demon lord? And uh, skipping ahead somewhat. the uh, So he rules the 600 lay of the abyss, an endless maze that hides countless traps, perils and hidden secrets. While fiendish minotaurs are the most populous of the inhabitants of the realm, they're also, they're also the least powerful. Baphomet's personal symbol is a twisted maze, a wash in blood. If you encounter Baphomet himself, he's at least 12 feet tall. Uh, depictions of him vary somewhat, but um, he's horrific. Uh, even his aspects are quite horrific. His Baphomet's interests on the material plane are generally beneath his immediate concerns unless they directly relate to his ongoing wars with Grast and particularly Yanogu. 
In all other cases, he allows his aspects a great deal of autonomy and autonomy in leading this cults, providing advice and otherwise seeking to uh, uh, seeing to his interests. Often, an aspect of Baphomet secures itself as the leader of a tribe of minotaurs and uses those creatures as a private army to accomplish its goals. Baphomet's aspect generally appears similar to his true form, that of a muscular minotaur. Um, he's got an ogre-like body, he's at least 12 feet tall, with the head of a minotaur. Um, his cultists sometimes call upon his aspect with a planner ally or planner binding spells, but um, he quite often plays tricks on them and sends another uh, demonic entity, and such as an Ankashar, in his stead, just to see if his cult will survive the encounter. Baphomet's driving goal is the destruction at the moment, and for the last several hundred thousand years, the destruction of his hated foe Yenogu. Neither demon lord remembers the genesis of this mutual hatred, but most of Baphomet's actions on the material plane are tied in some way to this war effort against the demon prince of Knowles. It is the harvesting of fresh souls that fuel his abyssal holdings to the acquisition of potent magic items for his most powerful agents and generals. On the abyss, Baphomet's obsession with this war is even more apparent. He often personally leads vast armies of fiendish minotaurs, Bulizau and Guristro, against Yenogu's concern on other layers. Likewise, Yenogu's constant attacks on Baphomet's outposts frequently force the Prince of Beasts to retaliate and reinforce. Actual attacks against the Yenogu's realm, or attacks on the Endless Maze by Yenogu for that matter, are rare, since neither Demon Lord wants to waste his resources assaulting his enemy at the core of his power before he erodes that power elsewhere, and they learn their lesson very well uh, when long, long ago, after the, uh, the War of Law Against Chaos, Demogorgon came and wasted both of them uh, because they'd weakened their power bases so much that the Prince of Demons could just take over. The Prince of Beasts has long been a lord of the abyss, and in those centuries he has made his share of alliances. Perhaps the strongest alliance uh, was that with the Lady Pale Knight, an enigmatic and unknowably ancient demon lord who dwells in the same layer of the abyss Baphomet does. Um, he, uh, even stranger, certainly... Um, the uh, two demons never join forces to accomplish a goal, but others, uh, attempts to lay siege to either Pale Knight's holdings or the Endless Maze are met with resistance from both of them. So that's something to keep in mind. Certainly Baphomet's dalliances with uh, Pale Knight resulted in his contact with an even more ancient demon from the primeval abyss, a fecund lord known only as the Dwergus, the Crystalis Prince. Uh, the uh, the Chrysalis Prince. Baphomet created the Tower of Science and began to breed and shape unique demons in his image not long, long after a period of time spent with Dwergus. So it would appear that this mysterious demon lord has some control over the shaping of demonic races. Demogorgon, who uh, has also approached Malkinthet, the Queen of the Succubi, several times in recent attempts to forge an alliance with her, yet their shared hatred of Yenogu is not enough to overcome the other, otherwise overwhelming differences in their personal style and grooming. With other demon lords, Baphomet's alliances tend to be brief and spontaneous affairs born out of sudden necessity rather than any real calculated moves. His latest brief alliance was with Ardat, the shrill and emotional queen, demon queen of harpies. When Baphomet wanted to enlist the aid of a cabal of half-fiend harpies known as the Soul Sirens in a brutal attack against the Null Empire city, of Hykenaxk in the contested uh, abyssal layer of uh, Vorganamund. Vorganamund is layer number 52. Once the Soul Sirens did their job, Baphomet betrayed them, stranding them on Vorganund as he turned his attentions elsewhere and adding Ardat to his constantly growing list of enemies. Baphomet regards several other demon lords with particular hatred, especially Grast and Orcus, both of whom recently managed to imprison Baphomet for a short period of time before he eventually escaped because he's pretty good at getting out of uh, traps and mazes. When he's not in battle, Baphomet spends much of his time in the Tower of Science, preparing for wars to come by breeding, shaping, and creating new forms of demonic life. He has met with great success in the past with the creation of demonic uh, races such as the Bulazau. Uh, the Bulazau look like uh, goat-headed minotaur-type creatures and the Gower and the Garistro. Even his mistakes or abandoned projects sometimes produce dangerous results, such as the case with the wretched Ankashars. 
His cults on the material plane comprise the bulk of Maphomet's faithful, from the lone killer lurking in a forgotten labyrinth to the murderous cults of minotaurs said to dwell in the maze-like sewers beneath some major cities. Most minotaurs are faithful in lip service only, having little patience or interest in things concerning religion, but a few would dare openly, uh, few of them would dare openly deny the power and sovereignty of the Prince of Beasts. Relatively solitary by nature, large tribes of minotaurs are nearly always the result of a charismatic priest of Baphomet who has gathered his kin to populate one area and guard a holy site. These sacred sites always consist of complex mazes built around portals to the abyss. Fantastic treasures like brazen skulls or key locations that the cult used to stage raids on their enemies. A cult of Baphomet worshipping minotaurs is a blight on the surrounding land, and its savage assaults on nearby settlements quickly drive out most other races. Yet, as savage and brutal as their attacks are against humans and their allied races, the true fury of Baphomet's servants is reserved for Knoll tribes. To a minotaur cultist, the murder of Knolls is the highest form of respect they can offer their prince for beasts. They believe that each knoll slain and offered to Baphomet is one less knoll in the mortal world and one more knoll petitioner in the abyss for him to personally destroy. A growing number of humanoid cultists have taken to Baphomet's worship in poor rural areas. Desperate commoners sometimes turn to the worship of beast cults organised by evil rangers who claim to venerate a nature deity, promising vengeance to those wronged by the government or other city dwellers, such as tithe takers and tax collectors. These rangers call themselves the Temple of Redemption, or simply Redeemers, and they view worship of Baphomet as the primal state of being, and think of those who worship other lesser deities as having lost their way. The crusade to redeem those lost worshippers is little more than a fanatic excuse for murdering and depravity. Rituals involve the decapitation of prize bulls, and they're the most important part of the Redeemer faith, and it's said that those who listen to the mouth of a sacrificed bull can sometimes hear whispers of advice on how best to punish those who oppress the common folk. These whispers are, of course, the doubtful advice of Baphomet himself. Unlike many other demon cults, redeemers take na- make no effort to hide their depravity and cruelty. Since they are typically based in small, remote settlements, they simply keep word of their presence from reaching more civilized areas by cowing anyone in the immediate area with fearsome threats and promises of violence. Those they deem too dangerous to live are captured and bound to a cruel T-shaped iron frame, usually spiked and wicked, and decapitated in a short but bloody public sacrifice. Typically, they will strap them to the T-shaped structure and just slide a blade along the top of it, taking the head off. Clerics of Baphomet have access to the domains of chaos, evil and strength, and their favoured weapons are the glaive and the great axe, which are also the favoured weapons of their demon lord. If you look, use the Book of Wild Darkness from an older edition, uh, you can also have access to the bestial domain as well. Thralls of Baphomet are brutal warriors who serve the Prince of Beasts as unholy champions. They often act as leaders for groups of minotaurs, ogres, giants, and other monstrous worshippers of Baphomet, particularly hill giants. In humanoid society, a thrall of Baphomet is more likely a notorious and feared mercenary or bodyguard in the service of a high-ranking cleric. A thrall who manages to attain uh, a bestial blessing, which is, can take the form of self-mutilation, so that they look oh, really horrific, uh, may pledge their service directly to Baphomet, and those who displease the Prince of Beasts are then eaten by a manifestation of him, but those who approve, he approves of, generally given large areas of a maze th- uh, within the abyss as their personal domains to guard and patrol. So obviously... Any visit to the the maze of Baphomet can result in <laughs> encountering these things all the time. Moving on. Um, so the Bulazau are um, their... What do they look like? So the Garistros um, will be familiar with uh, the immense hulking demons that combine the brutal visages of bison, a bear, and overly muscled man. Gaur demons are smaller versions of the more destructive Garistro, used primarily as ambassadors and advisors to his minotaur, ogre, and giant cultists on Faerun. Gaur demons are detailed in Lost Empires of Faerun, which I'll be talking about later as well. And they're only rarely encountered on other worlds and planes, with the obvious exception of the Abyss itself. So he makes demons for specific worlds. The Ankshar, Ankshar are um, horrific. Uh, the Bulazau are the... They're, it's flesh twitches and writhes, 
Festering with open sores and patches of discoloration, the demon's frame is painfully thin, festooned with short patches of bristles here and there. Its head is that of a large, sickly ram with massive curved horns, pale watery eyes, and froth-caked lips stretched over thin, needle-like fangs. Its tail uh, writhes snake-like, its tip a twisted tangle of metallic spines. Despite its emaciated frame, the beast wields a giant ransur, uh, far too large for its size, with unnerving grace and control. So essentially they just wade into combat, slicing everybody to pieces with these things. The Ankashar is... Um, they, the first Ankashar was almost an accident created by Baphomet on a whim when he was seized with a fleeting urge to design a demonic mount to ride into battle. But he abandoned this plan when the result turned out to be far too ill-tempered to trust in combat. They are ter- It's a terrifying creature that looks like a skinned bull a man, a bear, and a reptile melded together in one horrific single creature. Its head is a misshapen combination of all four forms, with large horns and a fanged snout. Its body is vaguely bull-shaped, with six legs that are a tangled mess of limbs, uh, mixing bear, human, and reptilian features, oh, and bull, but some, not all, not all of them are hooved. It's large bat-like wings, and it's got a cruel hooked claws on the wings and it's got a long almost crocodilian tail today the Ankshars are limited to a region immediately surrounding the tower of science but they breed true and their presence is expanding throughout the maze with this sense of humor strikes and baphomet sometimes sends an Ankshar to the material plane to a cultist that beseeches for aid figuring that if they can't they can't survive and benefit from such a wildly dangerous and unpredictable gift they're better off not existing in the first place Baphomet claims the 600th layer of the abyss, as I've said, a realm known to scholars as the Endless Maze. This layer of the abyss is infinite in size, a sprawling labyrinth of twisting corridors and eternal hallways. Um, it does have a core, though, and this this Baphomet's palace and the core, of the, the area around it is known as Lick, uh, Lictian. Lictian. The endless maze itself sprawls in every direction. The passageways range in size from narrow crawlways, etc., etc. Near the Lictian and Baphomet's other immediate points of interest, the maze in architecture is intricate, clean, and well maintained, with walls of ivory, white marble, granite, and porphyry. But, of course, it's sprayed with blood and gore. Most of these passageways remain at a fairly constant temperature, about uh, 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Was it 50, 80 degrees Fahrenheit? Although some remote passageways and temperatures can vary wildly, light is a rarity in the maze as the denizens of Baphomet's realm have little need for it on um, on their hunts. In several areas of the endless maze, the labyrinth opens out into what some travellers assume are vast open-air regions. Where the maze, uh, maze opens into these regions, jagged cliffs or worked walls of stone soar upward and out of sight. Other entrances to the maze may exit at any height along these walls, sometimes as complex balconies or clusters of mysterious towers with flickering lights beckoning with their strange narrow windows. The sky often has an unnerving grey cast and seems to be curiously low as if the place were constantly overcast with gloomy clouds. Light exists in some these open air regions although it's scarcely more than one would expect it um, from a twilight. In fact the clouds above uh, simply mask the truth that there's no sky. Only the endless maze, only higher ceilings of unworked stone along which scampering unseen demonic insects writhe and scuttle. Every now and then one of these things dies and falls to the ground below, giving rise to rumours that the abyssal layer above the endless maze is a realm populated by insectoid monsters, an endless hive. The primary inhabitants of the endless maze are fiendish minotaurs, large tribes of these monsters dwell in the maze each laying claim to a different section of tunnels and they have the, with their own tribal identity. Most of these tribes are led by half-fiend minotaurs, minotaur thralls of Baphomet or rogue Bulazows, which have escaped from their duties in the Blood War. In the large tunnels, it's not uncommon to encounter wild Garisto demons who have yet to be captured and claimed by other demon lords. Baphomet turns a blind eye to the hunting parties of demons, made primarily of Glabrizu, sent to the Endless Maze to seek out and capture these Garistroi for their own masters. The Prince of Beasts figures that he can always make more of them if he needs them. Ankashar are common in the eroded regions of the Endless Maze, particularly near the Morbid Tower of Science. Other demons are common as well, particularly near areas where portals to other abyssal layers exist. 
Portals to layers ruled by demon lords such as Grast, Orcus, Pazuzu, Pale Knight, and Malkvet are known to exist within a few days' travel from Lictium. While countless other certainly exist further away, the Endless Maze is not without its wild animals as well, mostly ill-tempered beasts like fiendish bison, dire animals, and monstrous beasts like chimera, manticores, and gorillions. Although these monsters are unorganized and tend to keep to fairly limited territories because they are hunted by far worse wretched horrors in this place. One other cast of denizens is in the Endless Maze should be mentioned as well. These are the desperate souls known only as the Lost. Most of the lost are humanoids, a fair number of which are gnolls and humans, set loose by Baphomet by the hundreds every few months from prisoners harvested deep below the palace. Baphomet allows these prisoners to make their way into the endless maze as they will only, uh, as they as they will only to hunt them down at his whim. Often, when an allied demon lord or powerful spellcaster comes to visit, Baphomet allows his visitor to hunt the lost within the maze promising aid only if the visitor captures specifically individuals that have been um, have managed to avoid capture by the Prince of Beasts for a, uh, for a length of time, those who have frustrated him somewhat, those who find he finds worthy prey some time ago. In a few remote corners of the maze, these groups have managed to band together into small, desperate communities who spend most of their time in a hopeless attempt to map the labyrinth, seeking uh, constantly a way to make their way out into safety. But in almost every case, the way out only leads to greater peril elsewhere in different layers of the abyss. Um, the, the fields of brass... Uh, Baphomet's taste for battle is matched only by his interest in watching great beasts fight to the death, usually each um, other, but sometimes against particularly troublesome adventurers he's captured. He constructed the fields of brass to serve as an arena for the mightiest of these fights, building it into a bowl-shaped crater. This immense area measures nearly a thousand feet in diameter. The fighting grounds themselves consist of an ovoid-shaped field of brass plates hammered crudely into the ground by overlapping patterns. These patterns themselves form a uh, sort of a maze-like design and protrude and they provide an unforgiving surface in which to do battle, jagged, sharp, quite often uneven. The surrounding walls are not actually tiers of seats, but a curved uh, section of open-air labyrinths that are often incorporated into the battles when creatures in the central area attempt to flee into them. Of course, these passages are heavily trapped and are also in good view of the immense throne of brass and bone that Baphomet typically watches from on the field's highest rim. The Lictian Baphomet's, uh, Baphomet's Palace rises from a mesa in a large chamber at the heart of the Endless Maze. This massive structure is kept in immaculate shape by hundreds of constantly toiling closets who work to ensure that no blemish mars the building's facade. The palace is surrounded by a maze-like moat that extends outward to a radius of a mile. This moat maze is an insanely complex three-dimensional labyrinth of stairs, bridges, towers and slopes that is populated by the most savage of Baphomet's favoured beasts. The Lictian itself is a towering structure, although the layout of the interior is unknown. One thing is certain, a number of portcullises that open directly from the Lictian's foundations into the surrounding maze-like uh, moat would indicate that the Lictian below the uh, the dungeons below the place harbour what can be uh, what one of the greatest collections of exotic and dangerous beasts in the abyss. So basically, uh, Baphomet spends his time hunting down the worst uh, horrors in the multiverse, and particularly in the abyss, to take back and keep as pets that he can release um, <laughs> like hounds. The Tower of Science is an immense cylindrical chamber. That has um, that's made of brass and iron, nearly filling the chamber, leaving only a 15-foot wide gap between its outer walls and the ragged inner walls of the cavern in which it stands. There are no entrances into the tower or at the ground level, although there are dozens of bridges connecting doorways to the tower's side passages, leading into chambers of varying heights. The tower roof is a large dome that incorporates a wide groove exposing the circular chamber within. This chamber can rotate and a ridged ramp can be extended allowing access to any one of 13 different openings in the chamber roof leading to different parts of the endless maze. The tower itself is about 100 feet wide and 300 feet tall. It contains 16 separate floors, each dedicated to a different science that Baphomet holds dear. These sciences include such devotions as torture, death, skinning, taxidermy, vivisection, 
dissection, flesh grafting, breeding experimentation, and the construction of new skeletal frameworks by mixing and matching bones from hundreds of different donor creatures. Yet, for all the grim and sinister purpose of these floors, the rumours of what goes on in the dungeons below the Tower of Science are what most scholars of the Abyss fear to even whisper. For it is said that Baphomet keeps immense flesh pits and bone gardens below that which he uses in endless attempts to create new demonic life. The Balazau, the Gaur, the Garistro and Ankasar demons represent his successes, but they are said to pale in comparison to the monstrous failures that flop and sputter in these damned vaults. And deep below these horrendous chambers lie what may well be the greatest horror the Endless Maze has to offer. The infamous, infamous maze of the misbegotten, an unmapped underlabyrinth that lies in the shadow of the endless maze above and serves as home to the cancerous and ruinous monstrosities that even Baphomet, Prince of Beasts, would rather see locked away. Uh, there is a famous artifact within the um, the maze as well, which sometimes shows up in the Prime Material Plane here and there, which is called the Brazen Skull. It's a minor artifact. Baphomet doesn't generally pay close attention to the actions of his cultists on the material plane, but that's not to say that he's not interested in their goals and development. He simply counts his war with Yenogu as more important. When he first discovered that many rural communities were turning to his worship, he created 13 brass busts of his uh, bestial visage, so they look like bull skulls, well, demonic bull skulls, fanged and, and furious looking things. Um, named the brazen skulls, each of these cumbersome minor artifacts looks identical. A brazen skull appears to be a bull skull made out of riveted plates of gold. The uh, her horns are real but are painted with blood. The eye so sockets contain large milky pearls, and instead of a cow teeth, the skull has red metallic fangs. The skull sits on an iron podium covered with hooks that hold it in place. The spirits of the Minotaur clerics Baphomet sacrificed to create these items still exist, although they remain dormant most of the time. A brazen skull's attendant spirit can be awakened by anointing it with the blood of a humanoid sacrifice. Doing so causes the skull's eyes to glow with a ruddy light. The person who anointed the skull can then beseech it for a demonic boon. Each skull has the spellcasting power of a 13th level cleric, although its selection of spells is limited. In order to convince the spell to cast uh, the skull to cast a spell, the user must make an intimidate check, and uh, as a full round action, failure indicates the skull grows dormant and cannot be used again for the remainder of the day. So you literally have to to scare this thing into working for you. Success indicates that the skull casts the spell for the user at the target indicated. Uh, the brazen skull typically has the following spells: uh, it can create water, cure light wounds. Cure moderate wounds, cure critical wounds, um, can create magic vestments, uh, can restore somebody, can enlarge a person, desecrate an area, uh, break enchantments, and um, yeah, creates magical circles against good, obscure objects, uh, even resurrect people or speak with the dead, um, and stone skin and zones of truth. Spells do not replenish naturally. The user must partake in a vile ritual involving the sacrifice of a living creature, of course, not necessarily an intelligent one, at midnight. This ritual takes an hour to perform, and if the skull has been used to cast any of the spells within the previous eight hours, the ritual fails. Otherwise, it automatically restores all previously cast spells. The, uh, there's a famous cult, there's another article um, talking about the cult of Baphomet. Uh, the Prince of Beasts is the patron of Baphetors. Um, and minotaurs and is venerated by many members of those accursed races. Other races that sometimes pay Baphomet honour include giants, usually hill giants, and ogres. Shrines dedicated to the Prince of Beasts have been found in caves beneath the great grey land of Thar, swallowed by, up, by the, um, up by the fens of the cold field, on hilltops amidst the foothills of the ice spires, and in the North Dark, a region of the Underdark beneath the north, um, which is near Mithril Hall and um, Menzo Baranzan and the other areas, in the depths of the maze of tunnels known as the Labyrinth. The cult of the Labyrinth, largest of Baphomet's currently active cults, wanders through the countless tunnels and rifts of the region for which it's named, in search of prey and sites sacred to the Prince of Beasts. Members of the cult believe that demons in service to Baphomet have hidden shrines to their master throughout the region and that by seeking such sites they give homage to the Prince of Beasts. It's said that one such shrine holds a brazen skull. The ranks of the cult are populated by both the true faithful of Baphomet and outcasts from many races who have lost their way amid the myriad passages. 
The cult is brutally controlled by a foul zealot who claims to be the offspring of the Prince of Beasts and calls himself the Gorgotor. This Tauric Gorgon drives his followers to the limits of exhaustion in their devotion and murderous forays. The cult of the Labyrinth regularly attacks Underdark merchants, seeking to reverse to the North Dark, including Drow from Menzabranton and Duergar from Cracklestug as well, and as a result, the cult has drawn the ire of the churches of Laudeguel, Lolf, and Varen. So, there you go. Demogor- uh, Demogorgon and uh, the various, uh, well, the, the great big powers of the multiverse don't pay much attention to the spitty squabblings of the demon lords. But if you're involved in something like the uh, Blood War campaign or if you're traversing through the layers of hell and things, you can come across um, these sort of machinations and wars um, breaking out all over the place as these demon lords have got vast holdings across many different planes of existence where they do battle by proxy in different places kind of like you know every every place that you go where sickness and vileness and um, depravity and battle and bloodshed it draws these demons and these demon lords like flies um, they are attracted to battle that's what that, that's what they drive for that savagery and stuff but of course Baphomet in particular is um, that Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde sort of aspect of the demon lords where he can seem cultured and refined in his um, experimentations and his weird fascinations with science and mechanics and biology and things like that. But at the heart of it, he's a vile and vicious monster with uh, absolutely no qualms and inflicting vile torments on any living thing in his path. Thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, please hit the button, uh, the like button if you made it this far. Subscribe if you like what I do. Check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts for these videos, except not this one because most of it is literally just taken from Dragon Magazine because I couldn't have said it my- better myself. Buy some merchandise. we your geek with pride. And as always, thanks for listening. I'll be back with more videos for you very soon, including a homebrewed monster. If you're a Patreon, uh, Patreon supporter, please check out the uh, audio story that I read out for you this week and um, make some requests for more audio stuff that I can read for you um, on the channel. Other than that, have a great day, and I'll be back with more for you very soon.